Hey, welcome back. This is the final exam review for Calculus 2. And what I'll do is kind of go through the sections that will be on the final exam and give you question pulls from WebAssign. So I'll be taking all the questions from WebAssign for the final exam. Okay, okay so 5.7 um, is important. We started uh, in that chapter for the beginning of class. It was on the natural logarithm integral, so basically integrals of the form um, 1 over u du equals the ln of the absolute value of u plus c. So you're trying to um, get things into this form and then uh, apply that rule. So number six is kind of a crazy one. Uh, we have square root of x all over the square root of x minus six dx. Um, maybe not entirely clear how to proceed here, but you can um, set the denominator equal to u in hopes of accomplishing this feat. And uh, then the du, the derivative of square root of x is 1 all over 2 square root x. And then the derivative of 6 is 0, so you have then dx. Multiply both sides by 2 square root x. You get dx equals 2 square root x du. Um, and then you try to do your substitution, but it doesn't quite work, right? So you get uh, square root of x all over u times dx, which is now 2 square root x um, du. Uh, multiply out, you can factor out a 2, you get a 2 integral x all over u du. And that's bad. That's bad news, right? Because you don't want a mixture of variables. Um, later in Calc 3, uh, that's okay, and you could do multivariable uh, integration. But for us in Calc 2, we don't really know how to do that. So what we're going to do then is kind of go back to this first formula and hope to um, recover uh, a formula for x in terms of uh, u. Right, so um, you know the, the u must be equal to the square root of x, uh, u plus six in particular. So yeah, the square root of x is equal to u plus six, and then square both sides to get a formula for x. Right, so x must be u plus six squared. You got a foil. You get u squared plus twelve x plus thirty six. Okay, okay. So then you could substitute that in for for x. And it looks like a looks like a real mess, but you could then um, whoops, that should be a 12u. So uh, 12u plus 36 all over u. Then you could uh, you know chop that up into a bunch of little fractions. Uh, so u squared over u is just u plus 12u over u is just 12 plus 36 over u. There's your natural log part. And then du. Um, then go ahead and integrate. So it'd be 2 times u squared over 2 plus 12u plus um, 36 ln absolute value of u. And then plus c. Distribute your u, or distribute the 2 and you back substitute. So you're going to get. Um, square root of x minus 6 squared plus 12 times square root of x minus 6, oops, 24, because you're distributing the 2, and then plus 72 um, ln absolute value square root of x minus 6, and then plus c, and uh, that'll do it. Okay, so that's that first problem. I just thought it was a little harder um, because of that weirdness with the, you have to go back and figure out how to get get a replacement for x. Okay, anyways, um, then moving along to 5.8. 5.8 was the arc tan and arc, so, uh, uh, arc uh, the inverse trig functions, right? So one, two, uh, I won't put any like arc secants on there, those are just nuts, but one, two, four, six, eight, you should have your uh, inverse uh, sign and inverse tan formula is memorized. So we have du of the square root of a squared minus u squared. Um, that's arc sine. Whoops, I want to double up on the inverse part there. Arc sine of uh, u all over a plus c. 
And then the integral of du all over a squared plus u squared is going to be your arctan. So only those two forms. Um, the other ones, whoops, I forgot a 1 all over a out in front, and then plus c. <coughs> all right, so those two forms you need to memorize for the test. Uh, let's look at number two. This guy is an arctan. 32 all over 1 plus 16x squared dx. Cat's trying to make it so he mutes my. He, I don't know how he does it. Every time he jumps on my lap, he mutes the sound on my video. I don't, I don't understand that. It's like a, it's his only skill. <laughs> you know, he doesn't have any abilities except that. That's his one ability in my house. Okay, so we're going to um, try to get into the form of the arctan. Obviously, the a value is just 1, but uh, we're going to have to do a u sub, um, u equals 4x, and then du will be 4dx, and dx will be du over 4. So we can factor out the 32. I have the integral of 1 all over 1 plus u squared times dx, which is now du over 4. Um, you could factor out the 1 fourth, you get 8 integral du all over 1 plus u squared. The a value is just 1, so you have 8 times 1 over a, which is just 1, times tan inverse, or arctan if you wish, of uh, u all over a. Um, and then plus C, and of course A is 1. Should we just put 1 there? And then we want a bag sub to get everything in terms of X. So I have um, 8 arctan of uh, 4X, and then plus C. Okay, great. Um, our 5.9 was on the hyperbolics. We'll skip that for the final. Uh, but remember, the hyperbolics are a lot like the uh, trig functions with regards to their derivatives and their integrals, like the derivative of cinch is cosh. It was those things. Okay, okay. 6.1 then uh, is the introduction to differential equations, and we began by noting that the solution, you can find the solution of very simple differential equations just by doing integration. Okay, so here is a differential equation, and what we're doing is looking for this unknown function y. Um, later we did separation of variables, but for here all you really need to do is integrate. So the solution will be y equals the integral of x times the square root of x minus 18 dx. And I picked this one because it's a lot like the first problem we were doing. Um, where you'll do a u sub, but it doesn't quite work out, right? So we have a u sub for x minus 18. Um, du will be dx, and uh, so we get y equals the integral. Sorry, you can't like do that. That is bad. I'm gonna have to skip to another line or just use an equal sign. And I can't get the eraser to work. There we go. Okay, so this is equal to the integral of x times u du. And of course, again, we have this problem with this extraneous x floating around. So what you have to do is go back to the original um, substitution and solve that for x. So you get x equals u plus 18. And then uh, you should be able to do your work. So. Uh, this should be u to the one half, by the way. Anyways, u plus 18 um, times u to the one half du, and then you can distribute. Okay, so you end up with the integral of u to the one times u to the one half is u to the two halves times u to the one half, which is u to the two halves plus one half, which is three halves, and then plus 18 u to the one half uh, du. And then you could use power rules on those. So you get u to the 5 halves times 2 fifths plus 18 u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds plus c. I have the back sub now. So I got 2 fifths x minus 18 to the 5 halves 
3 goes into 8 6 times, 6 times 2 is 12, and then x minus 18 to the 3 halves, and then plus c. Uh, that does it. Okay. okay, so every differential equation at its heart is really just an integral problem, but um, unfortunately, you can't always just do integration to get your answer. So the first method we, we kind of uh, hand off to you is separation of variables. And you see that in 6.3, problems 1 to 7. Um, in particular, let's look at number 6 because it's kind of nasty. So here I have 9y um, ln x minus xy prime equals 0. We want to solve for y. We want to find out what the heck is y. So the way we do it is separation. We want to get all the y stuff on one side, all the x stuff on the other. Okay, so I'm going to move the negative xy over, flip-flop sides. I get negative xy prime equals uh, 9y ln x. I'm going to divide both sides by x, divide both sides by y. Um, so I'll have 1 over y y prime is the same as dy over dx, it's just different notation. And then I have 9 ln x over here, all over x. You can move the dx to the other side. Okay, so you get 1 over y dy, and then 9 ln x over x dx. And now it's kind of set up for integration, okay? So just like in a, you can do an integral, you can square both sides, you can add something on both sides, now you can kind of integrate on both sides. Um, sorry. Just woke up. My uh, sinuses are really giving me issues. But um, anyways, integral of 1 over y is on line of absolute value of y. Um, this integral you're going to need a u sub for, so u equals ln x du is 1 over x dx, and then dx is going to be x du. Okay, um, So you can factor out a 9. I got the integral of u over x times x du. So that's ln absolute value of y equals 9 times the integral of u du. Hello? Can you hear me? I'm just making sure my, my uh, sound isn't been muted. I'm sorry. Uh, Ellen, the cat's tail keeps on hitting my, my button. Um, so I have to hold, I literally have to hold the, uh, okay, you don't care about my issues, but uh, um, 9 u squared, the integral of u is u squared over 2, um, and then we have a plus c on there. Um, back sub, ln absolute value of y equals basically 9 halves times uh, ln of x squared plus c. In these instances where we have the ln of y on one side, and, and kind of the way it's written right here, um, what you want to do is um, exponenti or, yeah, exponentiate both sides. To kind of get the explicit solution is what we call it versus an implicit solution. So exponentiating on both sides. On the left then the E and the LN kind of cancel and you have the absolute value of Y. On the right you have E to the 9 halves LN of X squared plus C, but you could rewrite that with our exponent rules as E to the C. Um, going to drop the absolute values, got a plus or minus on the other side. Uh, use commutative law of multiplication to rewrite this as e to the c times e to the 9 halves ln x squared. Um, and then finally, replace that thing with a, a constant. Okay, So get y equals c e to the 9 halves ln x uh, squared. Okay. All right. Sometimes, and I've had students complain a little bit about, you know, when do I solve for the explicit solution? When is it implicit? And that just comes down to experience. So over time, you'll, you'll kind of you know, get the hang of it. But yeah, for this one, you'd want the explicit solution, the y equals something form, and you would exponentiate to get, get the job done. Okay. Um, I, I'll leave out the other stuff. You're going to do a lot of that all. That is chapter six. You'll do it all again when you take differential equations. Um, Seven point one. They don't have a lot of exercises that are good in WebAssign. Some are kind of hokey because you have to plot using their plotting system. 
which is just a nightmare. So what I did was took some questions from the book. Um, on the final, I'll take some questions from the book, just like I did for the test. Uh, questions 15 to 27. So starting with 23, I have uh, f of y equals y squared, and then g of y equals y plus 2. So the deal in this section was finding the area between two curves. <laughs> So it's always um, bottom, uh, sorry, top curve minus bottom curve. Um, and that's for the orientation where your, your Riemann man is on the x-axis. Um, for the orientation where he's on the y-axis, it's, it's still, you kind of think of it as top minus bottom but the Riemann man is going up the flagpole, okay. like that. All right, so this will be the uh, flagpole type orientation. You get a picture of it. So y squared is just a parabola like this. y plus 2, um, if you're running up the flagpole like this, um, we have an intercept at 2. And then the slope is positive one, so it's going upwards as the Riemann man goes up. And uh, so we're looking for the area in between those two curves. Um, so my integral uh, will be the y plus two minus y squared dy. And then uh, I need to figure out, you know, these these bound these limits on the y-axis. So you have to set the two equations equal to each other and solve. So we get y squared minus y minus two is zero. So y minus two, um, y plus one is zero. So you get y equals two and negative one. So I'm gonna go from negative one to two on the y-axis and then it's just integrate. Okay, so you'll have y squared um, plus 2y minus y cubed all over 3. And I want to evaluate that from negative 1 to 2. So plug in 2 first, you get 4 plus uh, 4. Should be y squared over 2 first off. I'm sorry, I have a cat that is wagging his tail rapidly all over the mute button. I'm just trying to keep the button from being muted so I don't have to redo yet another video. And there's no way to hold it because he insists on moving around. Okay, so I think I got this figured out. All right, so um, what do we have? Four over two, and then plus four minus eight thirds minus uh, negative one squared and one half minus two plus one third. Um, all right, so I got two uh, plus four is six. Negative eight thirds minus one thirds. Negative nine thirds is minus three. Um, minus one half plus two. Eight five minus one half is nine halves. Okay, great. Um, so uh, from there, uh, there's some. You know, that was all the rotation section, you know, doing the rotations and the shell method, and we're going to skip that, and the disk method will skip that. Um, probably the only thing of, of value then to me for the future uh, generations would be the um, arc length formula. Um, so you, that's 7.4, but I'm not going to put it on the final. I just want to harass you for one second with the arc length formula. So if you have a curve in the plane, um, to find the length of that curve, it's the integral of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. So it has that feel of kind of a, you know, a, the distance formula, has that distance formula feel to it. But anyways, you use that a lot more uh, in Calc 3 and uh, so it is a bit more important, at least in that setting. Okay, so from there we move on to chapter eight. Um, 8.1 was basically everything you wanted to know about integrals, but we're afraid to ask. So 7.4 is not on the test, okay? 
But I'll just warn you, once I got to grad school, I had to take yet another SAT, which is called the GRE. And in particular, they have a specialized version of that. So you have to take the GRE, um, like general test, like, which is like the SAT. But then if you go into a specific program like math, you have to take the GRE specialized test, which is that they have a math uh, test. This, this formula, they wanted you to have that thing memorized for that GRE specialized test formula, but that's grad school, so I guess, I don't know. They think you're the master of everything, but you know, oh, I just got all these formulas memorized. But, uh, all right, well, um, here's uh, 8.1. It was everything, like kind of a review of integration before they got into the, the, the um, more advanced methods, I guess, if you want to call them advanced. But, um, anyways, here's our integral. We can factor out the 83 of the integral of what all over e to the negative x plus 1. You may think you want to do a u sub here, but the, the appropriate approach would be to multiply top and bottom by e to the x. And then you could do a u sub. Because right now you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to get a cancellation. But if you do this, then you'll have e to the x all over... Uh, you know, distributing e to the x times e to the negative x is just 1, and then uh, plus e to the x times 1 is e to the x dx, and then you could do your u sub. So you should be able to do long division, um, completing the square, uh, problems where you kind of um, have to multiply by Pythagorean conjugates in the top and bottom, um, all that jazz, all the little tricks of the trade. Uh, anyways, this will become 83 integral e to the x all over u times du all over e to the x. So that's 83. The e to the x is cancel. I get du all over u. This will be 83 ln absolute value of u plus c, and then you're back subbing. So you get 83 ln absolute value 1 plus e to the x plus c. Okay. Um, the majority of the test, the final exam, is integration. Um, this chapter 8, okay, so that's where the majority of the problems will come from. Uh, anyways, 8.2, then we have um, by parts. Problems one to nine, not one to two. Sorry. And uh, you know, the you have the you have the Lee eight thing um, that tells you which is you. So uh, logs, inverse, uh, trigs, algebraic trigs, exponential. Um, I want to look at number nine, not because I would probably put number nine on the test, but because it does come up in. Uh, other classes, you still see this type of integral, and this is one of those loopy integrals. So you start out, you have to do your um, by parts, okay, so uh, from Lee 8, um, the trig comes before exponential, so u is the sine x, and then dv will be e to the x, um, du will be cosine x, dx, and then v will be e to the x again. So we have uh, e to the x sine x minus the integral of e to the x cosine x dx. And then you have to do by parts again. So Lee 8 says cosine. And then dv will be e to the x. So again, du is negative sine x this time. And then v is e to the x. So we could replace now um, this integral with uh, e to the x cosine x minus negative, so that would be plus integral of e to the x sine x. And lo and behold, we're back to where we started, right? So what you do is replace this thing and this thing with a variable. Usually they use the letter i. So i equals e to the x sine x minus e to the x cosine x. I have to remind myself to evaluate. Minus uh, i. Move the i to the other side. I have two i's then. So be e to the x sine x 
minus e to the x cosine x evaluated, and then divide by 2. So I have e to the x sine x minus e to the x cosine x all over 2, and evaluate from 0 to 7 for your answer. Okay, So it's that looping kind of phenomena which uh, does once in a while happen in your in your later classes, especially differential equations. Once you get the Laplace transforms, okay. Um, so evaluating this, anyways. Finally, the cat is going to leave me alone. Thank you, thank you. Have a good day. Um, e to the seventh sine seven minus e to the seventh cosine seven all over two, and then minus. Um, if you plug 0 in the sine, you just get 0. If you plug 0 in the cosine, you get 1. E to the 0 is 1, so you get 0 minus 1 all over 2. So your final answer um, is e to the 7th sine 7 minus e to the 7th cosine 7 all over 2 um, minus negative 1 half, so plus 1 half. Okay. And, you know, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't put a, a, a looper on the final... I mean, I could, I probably wouldn't though, but I just want to warn you, those things don't go away, all right? It may seem like, oh, this is something that we'll never do again, but if you keep taking math and science, that's not true. Uh, anyways, 8.3 is trig integrals. I'm just going to skip the 8.4 though, because these trig substitutions always turn into trig integrals, and I'll focus on not a large pool of questions, but just one to five, okay? Um, so the one I put, I'm putting in the notes here, I think was on the test. It's the square root of 64 minus x squared all over x dx. Okay, so I'm going to have to do a sine sub. x is going to be 8 sine theta. Um, dx is 8 cosine theta d theta. Then I need to solve for theta. So theta equals sine inverse of x over 8. And then I get my triangle, um, sine inverse of x over 8, so opposite over hypotenuse. And then the third side will be 64 minus x squared. Okay. <coughs> All right, so um, do your substitutions. So I have the square root of now 64 minus uh, 64 sine squared theta all over x, which is now 8 sine theta times dx, which is 8 cosine theta d theta. Um, then I could rewrite that numerator as the square root of 64 times 1 minus sine squared theta. 1 minus sine squared theta is just cosine squared theta, so you get 64 cosine squared theta. And then that's just equal to 8 cosine theta. So I could rewrite my integral as um, 8 cosine theta all over 8 sine theta times 8 cosine theta d theta. And you see it's a trig integral at this point. So you could factor out um, 64 eighths, which is the same as 8. Then I have cosine squared theta all over sine theta d theta. Um, then uh, cosine squared is the same as 1 um, plus sine of 2 theta. Whoops, but I don't, I don't want to go in that route. You, you want to use a Pythagorean identity here, sorry. So cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared theta all over sine theta and then d theta. And then you could butterfly the fraction and get... Um, 8 times the integral of 1 over sine is cosecant theta minus sine squared over sine is just sine theta and we can integrate both of those. I, I would give you the formula for cosecant on a test but it's um, the ln of the absolute value of cosecant theta minus cotan theta and then uh, the integral of sine is cosine, negative cosine but there's a minus there so it becomes plus and distributing the 8 as well, cosine theta plus c. Then you go back to the triangle and figure out what is cosecant. So cosecant is 1 over sine. That'll be hypotenuse over opposite. 
and then cotan will be adjacent over opposite and then uh, plus eight times cosine is um, adjacent over opposite so the eights will cancel there uh, and you'll just have um, the adjacent side 64 minus x squared plus c <coughs> and that will do it for that problem okay, so there will be a trig sub problem just one on the test um, let's move on to 8.5 so again 8.5 is is pretty important like in differential equations i don't think you ever see a trig sub but you do see these loopers from uh, doing by parts and you definitely see partial fractions okay um, all over the place so you kind of have to know how to do these um, and he was looking at number five <coughs> and there's four different kinds of setups there's the re linear repeated linear um, quadratic and repeated quadratic right so uh, to figure out which type you're dealing with, you have to factor the denominator. Um, you can factor out an x here, and then you got 7x squared plus 1. This is a linear times a uh, quadratic, so you need one, two fractions, one for each denominator. The first one's linear, so you put an x up there, uh, and then put an a up there in the numerator. The second one is quadratic, so you have 7x squared plus 1, and then you have to put the bx plus c in the numerator for that because it's quadratic, okay? If it was repeated, then you would just put another fraction, um, and you know, if it was seven X squared plus one squared, you, you would have to put another fraction, and the denominator, you put the seven X squared plus one squared, and then in the numerator, DX plus E. But all of those types come up in uh, differential equations, okay? So you will see them all again. Anyways, multiply through to get rid of the denominator. Nine minus x squared is equal to a times seven x squared plus one plus bx plus c times x. Um, I'm gonna equate coefficients. So if you want to, you can think of this as uh, on, on the left, you can think of it as negative x squared plus zero x plus nine. Now on the right, distributing the a, I have 7ax squared plus a plus uh, bx squared plus cx. And then um, equate the x squared parts. So you got 7a plus b on the right equals negative 1 on the left. Um, equate the x parts, so c equals 0. And then equate the constant parts, a must be 9. So I got seven times a is 63 plus b equals negative one. So b is gonna be negative 64. Then I could rewrite my integral. So I'll have the integral of a all over x um, plus minus b x all over, I lost my x there, seven uh, x squared plus one and then plus c, but that's just zero. So you don't need to put that, okay? Okay, the first one's easy, that's just a natural log, so 9 ln absolute value of x minus 64 integral. And the second one I'm going to do a u sub for uh, 7x squared plus 1. So du is going to be 14x dx, in other words dx is going to be du all over 14x. So I'll have x all over u times du all over 14x. Okay. So this will be 9 ln absolute value of x minus 64 fourteenths or 32 sevenths integral. The x's cancel and we just have a natural log integral. Okay. So this will be 9 ln absolute value of x minus 32 sevenths ln absolute value of u, which will be 7x squared plus 1 and then plus c. And do it. Okay. Okay. Um, from there, I think we had like an approximation section, which is, um, which is important if you end up going the, into a discipline called numerical analysis. But I think for us, we're just going to skip over to 5.6, which is on limits. So you had, um, you know, the L'Hopital's rule, the generic L'Hopital's, where so long as it's infinity over infinity or zero over zero, you're good to go and take the derivatives. Um, 
and then you had all the weird ones, right? I want to do one of the weirder ones, clearly, um, number 13. I have the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of the ln of x raised to the x minus 1 power. So my advice was to rewrite this as an exponential. So you have the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of e to the ln of the ln of x minus 1 ln of x to the x minus 1. Um, then you want to pass the limit into the exponent and use the power rule to rewrite um, this expression. Okay. So this will be um, e to the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of x minus 1 times the ln of the ln of x. All right, so as x goes to 1 from the right, the ln of x is going to go to 0, right? So as the ln of x is going to 0, the ln of that is going to go to negative infinity. Okay, so if you think about the graph of the natural log, if you have something going to 0 inside the natural log, it's going to force the natural log to go down, down, down to negative infinity. Okay, so this, this whole second part, ln of the ln of x, is going to go to negative infinity. That first part, if you plug in a 1, is going to go to 0. So you have another one of these weird forms, 0 times negative infinity. And the way we dealt with that was to use uh, a complex fraction. So 1 over 1 over whatever. Right. So if e to the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of the ln of the ln of x all over 1 all over x minus 1, and then I want to do the derivatives because that now it's uh, zero over zero. Uh, it's a ne infinity over infinity. Technically, it's negative infinity over infinity, but that's still an apatolable form. So you go e to the limit as x goes to one from the right of one all over. I'm doing derivatives now. So one over ln of x times the derivative of the ln of x, which is one over x all over the derivative of 1 over x minus 1 is negative 1 all over x minus 1 squared. Okay, Just do a power rule. And uh, then I'm going to clean that thing up. right? So I'm going to multiply by reciprocals of the denominator. I get e to the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of uh, 1 all over x ln x times um, negative x minus 1 squared all over 1 and uh, that looks like it's a 0 over 0 form now so let me rewrite it a little bit and then we're gonna do Lapitas yet again so uh, x goes to 1 here and negative x minus 1 uh, squared all over x ln x. Okay, I'm going to do Lapitas again. So e, this will equal e to the limit as x goes to 1 from the right. The power rule in the first one is negative 2 times x minus 1. Downstairs you got to do a product rule. So the derivative of x is just 1 ln x and then plus x times the derivative of ln of x which is 1 over x. Okay. So this will be e to the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of negative 2 times x minus 1 all over ln of x plus 1. And now the form of that thing, if you plug in a 1, you'll have 0 over 1, which is good. That's equal to 0. Okay, So you just have e to the 0, and so our final answer is 1. Okay, so a bit of a harder one, but I'm not going to say that those never pop up in reality, or if you want to call it the future reality, um, but yeah. 8.8 uh, .8 is on improper integrals, and these do again come up um, in Laplace transforms, later on uh, in differential equations. If you keep on taking those. So I want to look at one that's a bit nastier. Um, number nine, I have negative infinity to zero and then x e to the negative seven x dx. Okay. So first I'm going to get rid of that negative infinity thing with a limit. So I take the limit as b goes to negative infinity of the integral um, of b to zero x e to the negative seven x dx. Okay, I got to do by parts on that then. So uh, from Li8, u must be x, and then dv will be e to the negative 7x. 
So V will be negative e to the negative 7x over 7. And then du will just be 1 dx. So using that to do a rewrite, we end up with the limit of um, negative x e to the negative 7x all over 7 minus the integral of this times this. So it become a plus 1 7 integral of e to the negative 7x dx. And then um, that's the limit of negative x e to the negative 7x all over 7 um, minus uh, e to the negative 7x all over 49. And I have to evaluate that from b to 0. Uh, so I'll have the limit as b goes to negative infinity of Putting in 0, the first term will be a 0, and then minus e to the 0 is 1, so 1 over 49. Then minus, uh, plugging in b now, minus b e to the negative 7b all over 7, plus, uh, rather minus, it's still minus. Getting ahead of myself. Minus e to the negative 7b all over 49. Okay. And then I, I kind of have to figure out what the heck this thing is doing. In particular, in that second set of parentheses, um, and you, you shouldn't do this, but maybe it kind of helps uh, just as a helper. Um, what you're dealing with in that first term here is, uh, what do we have? A negative, and then b is going to negative infinity, right? So we have negative, negative infinity, and then e to the negative 7 times negative infinity. That's going to just end up being uh, basically like 7 times infinity, right? And then all over 7. So negative, negative, you, you'll end up with uh, basically infinity times something going to an e to the infinity, which is basically infinity. So you have like an infinity times infinity there. And that will just be an infinity over 7. That's not going to mess it up. So that, that first guy is just going to be infinity. Okay. Long story short, if you think of it that way, and this part will be infinity. Then the second part is basically um, minus e to negative 7 times negative infinity will be some sort of positive infinity over 49. So overall, that thing's going to go to infinity as well. So you have infinity minus infinity, which is bad news, right? That's indeterminate. So what you do is just find a common denominator and then go from there. So limit is b to um, negative infinity of negative 1 over 49. Um, I'm going to go ahead and distribute the negative so I get, and, and then find a common denominator as well. So plus um, I need a, an extra factor of 7 to make this work, so I'll have plus 7be uh, e to the negative 7b um, my, uh, plus, then if you distribute that negative, um, e to the negative 7b, and that's all over 49 then. And then kind of look at that numerator, maybe uh, factor out, maybe that'll help a little bit. Uh, negative 1 over 49 plus, if you factor out the e to the negative 7b, you're left with 7b plus 1 all over 49. And then e, uh, so let's again think in terms of these infinities. We have basically e to the negative 7 times negative infinity. That's going to end up being some positive infinity, right? It's going to be negative 7 times negative 10 negative 7 times negative 100, negative 7 times negative 1,000. So it's just going to go to an infinity because those negative times a negative is positive. Then the 7b plus 1 as b goes to infinity, um, that's just going to go to, as b goes to negative infinity, excuse me, that will be like 7 times negative 100 plus 1, 7 times negative 1,000 plus 1. That's going to go to negative infinity, right? And then all over some constant, which is positive. Uh, regardless, the, the, the first term there, the e to the infinity is going to infinity, and then you have something going to negative infinity. So it's going to be like 10 uh, times 10, 100 times 100, but there's a negative in there. So it's really 10 times negative 10, 10 times negative 100, 10 times negative 1,000. In other words, that whole thing is going to negative infinity. Okay, So this whole thing here is a negative infinity. 
So the form overall is L minus infinity, so you end up with minus infinity. Okay. In other words, it's divergent. Okay. Okay, so those nasty kind of limits with these exponentials, they pop up all the time in uh, Laplace transforms later on. So I, I want to make sure that you are aware of what you're getting into. And I might not necessarily put one of those on the test, but they, they are going to be in your future. Um, anyways, uh, let's look at chapter 9. So for me, the end stuff is kind of the most important in my opinion. So intervals of convergence, radius of convergence, and then uh, making Taylor and Maclaurin series um, for functions. So uh, I'll just skip to 9.8 then. I'll look at problems like 1 to 13. And uh, then in particular, let's check out number 11. Um, so we have the sum of negative 1 to the n plus 1 times x minus 6 to the n all over n times 6 to the n. And we're going from n equals 1 to infinity. Okay. So I need the uh, interval of convergence for this monster. So you go to your ratio test. Um, I think we call that rho. The limit of the absolute value of, and you don't need the, the negative. The absolute value will kill off that negative 1 to the n plus 1. You just be left with um, x minus 6 to the n plus 1 all over n plus 1 times 6 to the n plus 1 times the reciprocal of a sub n which is n6 to the n all over x minus 6 to the n. And then simplify, so I have the limit of the absolute value of x minus 6 to the first power all over 6, 6 to the n over 6 to the n plus 1 is 1 over 6, times n all over n plus 1. <coughs> you can factor out the non-n material. So you get x absolute value of x minus 6 over 6 times the limit of n all over n plus 1. The limit of n over n plus 1 is 1. So you have uh, the absolute value of x minus 6 over 6. So this thing will be absolutely convergent when that expression is less than 1. So you set up a, a, an inequality, x minus 6 over 6, uh, less than 1, greater than negative 1, multiply through by 6. <coughs> Uh, add 6 to all three sides. And now we're left with uh, checking endpoints for convergence. Okay. So um, first I'll try 0. So plugging 0 in, I get negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 0 minus 6 to the n, which would just be negative 6 to the n all over n times 6 to the n. And then I want to simplify this, right? So I get negative 1 to the n plus 1 times this negative 6 to the n. You want to split that up, right? So it's negative 6 to the n is negative 1 times 6 to the n, which is negative 1 to the n times 6 to the n. So we have uh, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times negative 1 to the n times 6 to the n all over n times 6 to the n. The 6 to the n's cancel and you can combine the negative 1 to the n plus 1 with the negative 1 to the n. Negative 1 to the n plus 1 times negative 1 to the n is equal to negative 1 to the n plus 1 plus n which is 2n plus 1, then you could separate that into negative 1 to the 2n times negative 1 to the 1. Um, negative 1 to the 2n is really negative 1 squared to the n, and then times negative 1. Negative 1 squared is 1, so you get 1 to the n, and then times negative 1. 1 to the n is 1. 1 to any power is 1, so you just have negative 1 at the end of the day. So this will turn into the sum of negative 1 all over n, which is basically just a constant multiple of the harmonic series. And if you do a constant multiple, a non-zero multiple of the harmonic series, it'll just be, it'll have the same behavior. Okay, so this one is the uh, divergent harmonic series.
Okay, so that endpoint is divergent. Um, then we go to the other endpoint, x equals uh, 12, and plug that in. So we have the sum of negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 12 minus 6 is 6 to the n all over n times 6 to the n. The 6 to the n's cancel, and you're going to have an alternating series. So then you establish uh, or put in the alternating series test. So you have to tell me what test you're doing. So try the alternating series test. So first, uh, take the limit of a sub n. That's 1 over n. As n goes to infinity, that's 0. That's good. Secondly, uh, you have to establish that the terms are decreasing. So what you usually do is a ratio sort of test. Um, so you have 1 all over n plus 1 divided by 1 over n. That's equal to n all over n plus 1. The denominator is bigger than the numerator, so that is less than 1, and that means it's decreasing. Okay, so if those two things hold, then it's convergent. So hence, this endpoint converges. Okay. So at the end of the day, your interval of convergence is going to be 0 to 12, including 12. So that's 9.8. Uh, skipping then to 9.10, we're um, making Taylor and McLaurin series now uh, representations of functions. So something like 5, <coughs> where you have to kind of get all the derivatives and then put it in the form and then get the summation notation. So this one's centered at 1. Um, so first I have to get all my derivatives in, in order and kind of look for a pattern. So it looks like you're ending up with kind of a factorial type deal. Um, let's evaluate them at one and see what we get. So I can kind of see the pattern here. Um, uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and just kind of write it out. And you could leave your answer like that. You won't get full credit um, if, unless you do the summation notation. But this will get you 90% of the way there, right? So f of x is going to be 0 um, plus 1 times x minus 1 uh, minus 1 times x minus 1 squared over 2 plus 2 times x minus 1 cubed all over 3 factorial minus 3 factorial times x minus 1 to the fourth all over 4 factorial. So that will give you 90% credit if you just want to leave it that way. Please put the plus dot 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 because it's not a polynomial, right? It keeps on going. Um, but to get full credit, you really need to put it in the summation notation. So let's first let's kind of simplify it. Um, I'll have x minus 1 minus x minus 1 squared over 2 plus 2 all over 3 factorial. What is that? That's 2 all over 3 times 2 times 1. So this part will cancel and you just get 1 over 3. So I get x minus 1 cubed all over 3. And then same for this 3 factorial all over 4 factorial, right? Um, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 factorial. So I can remove those and just have 1 over 4. So it looks like I get minus x minus 1 to the 4th over 4. And then you can kind of see the pattern, right? The next one's going to be x minus 1 to the 5th all over 5, and then on and on. So it looks like it's going to be, we're going to have to have a negative 1 floating about in there to some power. Kind of put a box there. And then I need the x minus 1 to some power all over uh, some number, right? Some, and th those boxes need to be filled in terms of n. And I need to go from n equals some number to infinity. Okay, okay so I need, uh, I'll, I'll start at 1. You could, starting at 0 won't work um, if you, well, it depends on how you put your, you could start at 0 or 1, but it's, 
I'm going to start at 1. Okay. So um, if I put in 1, then I want my first term to be positive. So I'm going to have to put an n plus 1 on the negative 1 to make that happen. right? Because this is my first term, n equals 1. And there I need a positive. So if you put in n equals 1 into n plus 1, you get 2. And negative 1 squared is positive. So that will work. Right? And then this will be n equals 2 n equals 3. So I need to make sure whatever formulas I use work to produce those expressions. Okay, so what do I need for my exponent? I need, I just need 1, 2, 3, so just n will work. And then the same for the denominator, right? If I just put n there, it'll work. And that turns out to be the answer. That's exactly it. So you can kind of approach it that way, but like I said, if you want to just leave it as a big long sum, like the first a line I had done there. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. okay. Um, so let's leave chapter 9 behind then and go on to chapter 10. So 10.1 was on conic sections, which is very important, but we're going to leave that alone. Um, uh, conic sections become important in Calc 3 when you're working with quadric surfaces. And the way you identify a three-dimensional object is by looking at the cross sections, and the cross sections are usually uh, conic sections, okay, um, or degenerate conic sections. But uh, we'll start with 10.2, and what we were doing there is parametric equations, which is also important in Calc 3. Um, uh, converting uh, rectangular to parametric, parametric to rectangular, graphing, identifying orientation. So let's look at number eight. We have x is four secant theta, and then y is five tan theta. I want to convert this to rectangular coordinates, and I want to graph it, and I want to note the orientation. So to convert this one, it's probably from a Pythagorean identity because we're dealing with trig functions. So remember, 1 plus tan squared theta is equal to secant squared theta, right? So if I could solve for secant and tan, I can fill that in and get it in terms of x and y. So let's do that, right? So from the first equation, I note that secant theta must be equal to x over 4. From the second equation, I note that tan theta must be equal to y over 5 plop that into the Pythagorean identity there and I get 1 plus y squared over 25 equals x squared over 16. Move the y squared over 25 to the other side, flip-flop sides, I get x squared over 16 minus y squared over 25 equals 1. And that is a nice hyperbola. I'm not going to write it, draw it in all of its magical detail, but the branches will be on the x-axis because the x term is positive. Lastly, then, you need to identify the orientation, the direction you're traveling on this picture, because technically you're, you're kind of thinking of it as being traced out okay, with your parameter. So what I'm going to do is a little table. I'll have theta and then x, y. Okay. So I'll start at theta equals 0. Um, secant is 1 over cosine. Cosine of 0 is 1. So I'll have 4 here. Tan of 0 is just 0. So when theta is 0, I'm at 4, 0, which is right here. Okay. Um, then just tweak it a little. So go to pi over 4. Um, secant of pi over 4 is root 2. So I'll have 4 root 2. And then tan of pi over 4 is just 1. So I'll have 5. Right. So that's going to be up here somewhere. In other words, it's going upwards on this arm or that branch if you wish. Okay. On the other branch then I'm going to start at pi. Okay, so secant of pi is negative one, so I get negative four. And then tan of pi is zero. So I start at negative four zero right here. And then tweak it a little, go the three or, or rather five pi over four. Okay. So uh, secant of 5 pi over 4 is negative root 2. So I get negative 4 root 2. And then tan of 5 pi over 4 is going to be um, positive 1. Uh, so you have a 5 in front of it, so it'll be a positive 5. In other words, you're, you're up here somewhere, right? So go over 4, root, root 2, up 5. So again, it's moving upwards in that direction. So you have to show me the orientation like that. They'll put the little arrows. If you have no clue, just put some arrows on the graph and maybe you'll get it, right? 
All right, so that's 10.2. 10.3, then we're, we're getting into the calculus of parametric equations, um, taking derivatives, finding arc length. So again, we get another arc length formula. We, remember, we've already had an arc length formula. S equals the integral of the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared um, dx. And this form, in this section, you get the, the uh, parametric form of the arc length equation, which is x prime. Uh, squared plus y prime squared uh, dt. Uh, the, you don't have to have these me memorized for my test, but they will be back. Okay, they will be back. So to be continued in Calc 3. So just warning you, you don't need the norm for my test though. Uh, so, but anyways, uh, derivatives is kind of what I'll focus in on. So I'm looking at problems like one to seven. Let me just go through real quick and make sure I've, let me pause the video. Oops, I found one, 6.1. Uh, I didn't give you a question. <laughs> cool. Hold on. Great. All right, hold on again. Let me pause the video again. Okay, so 6.1, problems eight to 11. That's kind of what we're looking at. Sorry about that. I think I got the rest of them, uh, the rest of the question pulls there. Okay, let me get back to where we're doing. So we're doing derivatives and parametric equations. So 10.3 now. Um, let me make a note in my notes that I officially have the 6.1. So again, 6.1, we're looking at problems 8 to 11. Okay, so anyways, 10.3 then, taking derivatives, uh, problems like 1 to 7. Um, number 5, I like these. You find the equation of the tangent line to the curve at each point. I'll just do one point. Find the equation of the tangent line to curve at the point given. So they give us uh, the parametric equations, x equals t squared minus four, and then y equals t squared minus two t. You can get the uh, equation for the slope of the tangent line, it's just the derivative, right? So it's dy over dx. The derivative of y is two t minus two, the derivative of x with respect to t, just two t. Um, and then I'll do part a. So we want to know the tangent line at zero, zero. So you need a slope and a, a point. Um, in order to get the slope at this point, you need to figure out the t value. So you let x equal zero in the t in the x formula, so t squared minus four. t squared is four, so t is either plus or minus two from that equation. The other equation, let z equal, t, uh, let y equal zero, so you get t squared minus two t factoring t times t minus two. So here either two, t is zero or t is two. So you look for the common t value between the two of them. And that, that means we want t equal to two. So we get the slope at that point. And plugging in two, you get four minus two is two all over four. So the slope is one half. And then you go to your point slope form, y minus uh, y sub one equals m times x minus x sub one. Plugging in zero, zero, we get y minus zero equals one half times x minus zero. And there's our equation, okay. Okay, um, moving ahead to polar coordinates, which becomes important again in Calc 3. Um, you'll be integrating a lot over top of uh, circular regions. And um, so in Calc 2, you're integrating over a number line. In Calc 3, you, you're able to actually integrate over areas, okay? And a lot of time those areas are circles and the formulas for integrating over circles, they would be a bunch of square roots and stuff unless you go to polar coordinates and the equations become easier. So, uh, polar coordinates become very important in that setting. Anyways, um, for 10.4, I just want to make sure you know how to graph these things. 
Um, before I get there, the two most important graphs you can know are the basic ones, the, the circle graph. So if the radius here is like 3, the equation for that is just r equals 3. Okay? And then you have the, the shifted versions, the, this one and uh, this one. Okay? So if this point right here is 4, um, the formula will be 4 times cosine of uh, theta, right? And then if uh, this point, if, and it's basically the diameter, right? If this diameter of the circle is 3, it's r equals 3 sine theta. Those are the most important um, ones. Uh, in this book, of course, we, we're working with rose curves and uh, stuff like that. It's not as important, but I want to make sure you can plot them, right? So number 16, um, they ask us to plot a rose uh, curve for cosine of 3 theta, all right? So um, first, the amplitude is 4. Secondly, the period. Um, you wedge the 3 theta in between 0 and 2 pi and then divide by 3. So you get um, 2 pi over 3. And then the tick marks, you just divide that into 4 parts. So 2 pi over 3 divided by 4 is the same as multiplying by 1 fourth. So you get pi over 6 for your tick marks. Then we go to draw it. 1, 2, 3, 4, so this is 1 pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, and then 4 pi over 6. It's a cosine, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, so it starts up here, zips down, goes back up, and then keeps repeating, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I usually go up to 2 pi. Um, so for our polar graph in the xy plane, I need four circles here, two, three, four, and then my uh, sort of angle lines, and you got to show me all this on the test, okay? You can't just kind of fake it. Um, so I'm going by pi over sixes here, so one pi over six, two pi over six, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, okay, so let me mark those 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 pi over 6, okay, I'll put my plot in blue, so I start out at 4, and then it dies down to 0 at pi over 6, and then uh, from 1 to 2, it's negative. So it's actually in this other sector. And then from 2 to 3, it'll go back to 0. And then from 3 to 4, it'll pop back out to 4. And then from 4 to 5, it'll die back down to 0. And then from 5 to 6, it goes negative up to negative 4. And then from 6 to 7, it repeats itself. Okay, so we, we've traced out this thing going from 0 to 6 pi, uh, uh, to 6 uh, 6 pi over 6, which of course is just pi. Okay. And those boundaries become important when you're trying to do integration, right? So uh, be able to graph those, and then 10.5, you're doing integrals. Um, so basically problems like 3 to the 6, I just want you to find the uh, area of the interior of one of these guys. So problems like number 4, here we want two petals of the rose curve r equals 8 sine 3 theta. Okay. So uh, we want to draw this thing and kind of figure out our, our limits on our integral. Um, the integral form, of course, is 1 half f of theta squared d theta. So you have to have that memorized. Um, so first, the uh, amplitude is 8. Um, secondly, then, the, uh, the period uh, is going to go from, it's going to be the same as last time, right? But it will be kind of interesting to see how it changes because now we have a sine instead of a cosine. So 
So 2 pi over 3, divide it into four parts. There's pi over 6s. And I, I'm not going to put eight tick marks there, but this is up to 8. 2, 3, 4, going by pi over 6s. I have 6, 7, 8, want to go up to 2 pi, 9, 10, 11, 12, and sine starts at 0, and then we'll go up, back down, back over, repeat itself over and over and over forever, and I'm just going to put 1, uh, well, I'll, I'll go by 4s, right, so this will be 4, and then uh, over here is 8. <laughs> Okay, so maybe go by twos. So this will be two, four, six, and then eight. Okay. Again, you need uh, pi over sixes for your um, little angle lines. Two pi over six, three pi over six, four pi over six, five pi over six. Okay, let me label those. Two, three, four, five. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, I'll put it in blue. So this time you start at 0, and then it increases to 1 at pi over 6. Then it goes back to 0 at 2 pi over 6. Um, 2 the 3, it'll go negative, so it's down in this lower sector. And then 3 to the 4, it'll go back to 0. And then 4 to the 5, it'll jump back out to 4. And then 5 to the 6, it'll jump back down to 0. And 6 to the 7, it's going to go negative and repeat itself. Okay. So uh, looking at the two versions, and you can actually model these. I've seen them use polar graphs to model things in aeronautics, like airfoils and you know this the uh, cross section of wings these kind of look like propellers um, but uh, I don't know yeah so anyways this is just uh, it looks like the same propeller or uh, rose petal shape uh, just tilted by um, pi over six okay. just move all petals over by pi over six so kind of neat. Uh, anyways, then we need to find the area of two of these petals. And because everything's symmetric, you can almost guess it's symmetric. Um, you just multiply two times the area of one petal, right? So um, the area of one petal would be one half integral from zero to two pi over six, which is pi over three. That's the um, angle in which one petal was traced out. And then you have eight sine three theta squared. So that would give you the area of one petal. The, the question is asking for two petals. So you have to multiply that by two. Okay, okay so we'll have the integral of 64 sine squared of three theta d theta. And uh, factor out the 64 and then use our reduction formula, power reduction formula to rewrite this as one minus cosine of now six theta all over two d theta. Factor out the one half, you get 32 integral of one minus cosine of six theta d theta. Then integrate, you get 32 times theta minus um, sine of six theta all over six from zero to the pi over three. So I get 32 times pi over three minus sine of six times pi over three. Six times pi over three is two pi. Sine of two pi is a big zero. Plugging in zero, you get zero minus sine of zero is zero. So you just get 32 um, times pi over three or 32 thirds pi for your final answer. Okay. Okay, so that's the final exam. I enjoyed uh, teaching you from a distance this semester. I am wishing you all the best in the future. Thank you for watching, and hopefully see you next time. Bye-bye.